recording. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the Whole System Urgent Care for Older People with Frailty webinar presented by Dr Simon Conroy from the Acute Frailty Network. First of all, we have a few simple housekeeping points. This session is being recorded and the recording will be available to view on our website shortly. All attendees are muted to avoid any background noise during this recording. At the end of the presentation, there will be the opportunity to ask questions. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand option on the panel to the right hand side of your screen. Alternatively, you can write your question in the questions section on the same panel. During the question and answer session, we will unmute you for you to ask your question in person. However, if there is an issue with the technology, we will raise that question for you. Thank you, and I will now hand you over to Simon. Thank you, Cathy, and hello to all of uh, Cohort 2. We're really pleased that you're joining us, and um, I'm very happy to have an opportunity to share with you some thoughts about whole systems approaches for older people with frailty and urgent care needs. Um, I have to give you a slight uh, apology and a health, not a health warning, but just to get my excuses in early. I'm on call today, so I've just been running around like a headless chicken, uh, trying to get things under control in, a, in our frailty unit. So I'm uh, bringing these a few slides together very quickly, which will reflect the work that we've been doing over the last few years that I hope will be informative. Um, so let's just have a look. So the, the idea basically is to think about uh, not just the urgent care setting, which of course is the focus of the acute frailty network, but the interdependencies and interactions necessary for urgent care to work well. So effectively using the urgent care presentation as a prompt to look at how the whole system handles older people. And of course that in a way is what the four hour standard is all about. It's holding systems to account. So whilst a lot of our focus in AFM will be on how the urgent care assessment works, it will absolutely be recognize, absolutely recognise the importance of the whole system. And we're going to touch on what that might look like. Uh, using Leicester as an example, um, only because I know it well, I don't claim Leicester's uh, got all the answers and it certainly isn't the best system in the world, but it's one I know and can use to describe um, the principles that would be useful to follow. So we've conceptualised our system in Leicester as um, a whole system approach, and that's reflected in this name, Interface Geriatric. So the idea being that we're looking at the interface between acute and community care and geriatrics because we're focusing on older people with frailty. Um, and the rationale for doing that is, is, is well known to you all, the demographics, the clinical challenges, population presents, and fortunately the uh, availability of uh, evidence-based solutions that can be implemented so the demography, I think we've already been through this a few times recently, and I'm sure you're all very well aware of the growing number of older people, um, so that uh, it doesn't need any further discussion. Um, and you'll no doubt be aware of the challenges that this population appear to be um, putting onto uh, hospital and social care systems, uh, as well as primary care. And a lot of this, um, this is my personal view, and but others share it as well, I think is related to the fact that uh, hospitals, health and social care systems have generally been designed around the needs of people with unifactorial problems, so you know, either single issue medical problems or, um, well let's put it another way, I'm not taking the holistic nature of uh, older people's account into consideration. Um, and that's uh, seen in the clinical uh, arena, so uh, if you think about older people coming to the emergency department or the acute medical units, they typically present non-specifically, which means that they don't e can't easily access the sort of condition-specific pathways, for example, ambulatory care pathways at DVT or P or whatever it might be, um, because they often present with um, you know, falls or flares of mobility, uh, delirium, uh, for which there's a wide differential diagnosis. Uh, which doesn't fit easily into sort of uh, pathway specific or traditional pathway specific approaches. Um, there's also a slight risk, and hopefully this audience will not be uh, uh, will be familiar with the idea, but others will struggle with it. That because people present non-specifically, that there's a full sense of security. Oh, it's just a fall. Uh, it's nothing too serious, but of course it is. That's why they're here. And the challenge is to find out why they've fallen and what we can do to prevent it from happening in the future. So. If you're not careful, it's that people switch off to non-specific presentations rather than recognising them 
as a red flag and something important that needs to be addressed and managed in a, an assertive and holistic manner. Um, the reasons for the non-specific presentations often relate to cognitive, not always, but often relate to cognitive impairment, and that's uh, a big complicating factor in managing this population. But also the interactions between multiple comorbidities, which are you know, almost the norm for uh, older people as they go through life and accumulate a range of different illnesses. And again, if you've got multiple comorbidities, it makes it that little bit more tricky to fit people into simple pathways for single conditions. And, and our health and social care systems need to uh, mature in order to respond to people with more than one problem. One of the tensions here, which is evident both at the clinical level but also at the system design level, is the, uh, the tension between generalism and specialism. So specialist care is fantastic and very important and um, we need specialists to help drive the field forward. But the problem with increasing specialisation is that people tend to lose the generalist or holistic approach. Um, and reconciling those two can be difficult. That's something that needs to be tackled because uh, older people will have a, 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 a range of uh, comorbidities that need managing, not just the left atrium or whichever part of the heart you happen to specialise in. Um, and this has been a big feature in national policy. So, for example, the Future Hospital Commission has made a big point about drawing out generalist care from existing doctors, uh, consultants who have been trained in general medicine but then come into a speciality field and trying to uh, like capitalise on that capacity. Um, so many are willing, uh, many are able, uh, but not everybody, and that's something that needs uh, looking at. The other reason older people present non specifically is usually because the body is not quite as robust as it historically has been, um, so there'll be concomitant um, you know, functional decline or, or, or um, organ uh, failure, such as chronic kidney disease or reduced hepatic clearance, which makes uh, you know pharmacotherapy more challenging. And makes more vulnerable to functional decline um, and they often will need a period of rehabilitation rather than just management of their acute medical needs. And the final uh, component of the uh, understanding uh, the challenge is, is the idea of differential challenge. So this is the concept that those people most in need least able to access services and so if we design services that are uh, 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 designed for people with single organ, organ pathologies then that's going to be uh, make it more difficult for older people with multiple comorbidity to access pathways. Um, and this goes all the way through to you know, primary care, older people you know, living far from the GP, can't speak on the phone because of impairment, unable to get care and delay presentation. So this concept of different differential challenges uh, present throughout the pathway. Um, there are solutions. Uh, the, 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 the idea of uh, comprehensive geriatric assessment has been around for a long period of time. And we'll spend a little bit of time discussing what that looks like in, the, uh, in a short while. But um, there is a, a reasonably good evidence base for this. There's uh, about 20,000 patients that have been randomised over the last 10 to 20 years into studies that have shown that if you um, give or, or apply comprehensive geriatric assessment principles to older people with frailty, particularly with urgent care needs, you get better outcomes than if you just uh, provide usual care. So this is an evidence-based approach. There, there, there's uh, certainly not been any major acute uh, CGA studies that have uh, been carried out recently focusing on the in, in, inpatient setting, mainly because these studies are really difficult to, to, to deliver, uh, but whenever people have done uh, robust controlled evaluations or service evaluations, the same sorts of findings have been found, and we'll go through some of those again today as well. So CGA, we think, is a good thing for older people with frailty in urgent and urgent care needs. Uh, just going back to that slide, so the, one of the things coming out from the literature is that discrete units tend to offer better outcomes than liaison type services. And this is really important, um, but uh, it depends very much on the local setting, culture and context as to what's going to be available. So if you've got the possibility to create a, a, a unit, then that's great. Um, but simply sticking a sign above a award and saying it's a, a, an acute frailty unit or whatever it might be, um, is not as important as getting the process of care right. Other settings will you know, be, um, find it more difficult to establish frailty units, um, and that shouldn't necessarily be the focus. It's, the key is to get the team working, to get the processes of care right, and then if you can deliver those in a unit, which fosters team working, brings people together, and 
um, that gives a focus, if you like, to the care of this population, that's great. But the unit itself obviously isn't the solution. Um, it's the team, the environment, and the way that the pathways work in and out of that unit that make a difference. So what's the problem? So uh, I've touched upon already, there's a bit of a uh, overkill on some of the specialist side of things, uh, it can be argued, um, and perhaps a, a little bit of loss of the generalist approach. Um, the idea of integrated care, so that everybody should become a geriatrician or at least be able to care for this population is good, and we all subscribe to that, but um, not everybody does it, um, even though they probably can. Um, so something about attitudes and behaviours um, and changing those is a difficult and long process, but important. So in the short term, the idea is that you know, if you've got people that are willing, able and, and capable to deliver CGA, that you get them involved in the first instance, but the bigger win is longer term, and at getting all your staff uh, prepared and trained to manage this population. Uh, sorry, uh, the um, kind of silos that systems are constructed in makes life more difficult. A few, uh, a few places have got um, sort of uh, overarching management structures that include both acute and community provision for older people, and that's that's great. Um, just having the management structure in place, of course, doesn't develop the relationships in the ground between different sectors, um, and that can be difficult. There's, you know, it can breed mistrust, you know, and the need for reassessment, um, and getting acute and community teams, for example, working together by uh, del delivering rotating posts that sort of encourage people to have an understanding of how things work in other parts of the health and social care system is really important breaking down the potential silos that, that, that can exist. Um, these can be exacerbated by the sort of high level um, managerial structures, if you like. So if you've got multiple CTGs covering an area and you have to have uh, multiple interactions in order to improve a care pathway, that makes it more difficult. And occasionally there's some um, com competition between providers uh, rather than working together. Um, but these can be overcome, but again, the, the longer term uh, and slightly more tricky to achieve. Um, I'm just, just apologise at the beginning. Some of these slides are, 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 are not quite what I had intended for today, uh, but I, I will carry on. Oh dear, some connection difficulties. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk to you about our uh, integrated care pathways for old people in Leicester. Um, uh, it started back in 2010, 20, 2009, 2010. Uh, where we um, basically moved um, an acute take at Leicester General Hospital to Leicester Royal, so we consolidated two acute receiving units um, um, onto one site. We have a separate cardiorespiratory take at the Glenfield Hospital, so there were three receiving units, there are now two. Um, and at that time of reorganisation, it was um, agreed or uh, we managed to uh, negotiate uh, pulling geriatricians out from the general medical take and, and creating a dedicated geriatric take. And we knew that it wasn't going to be sufficient just to... Let me just switch that phone off. Sorry. Sorry about that. Very slick today, aren't I? Um, we knew it wouldn't be sufficient just to um, put geriatricians in the, in the acute unit and expect it to, to solve the problem. We tried to focus on creating vertically integrated care pathways uh, for older people. Um, that means uh, having yes, a presence in the acute hospital, but also um, a presence in uh, the community services, mainly in our case community hospital, because that's what was available to us, but uh, it could be uh, geriatric care at home, supporting multidisciplinary teams and in intermediate care type settings. So we focus our geriatric assessment in the urgent care setting. Uh, we work closely with our partners, including social care, and try to ensure that we have a clear understanding of what the offer was, uh, both in the hospital and across the interfaces, ensuring that care is coordinated and well communicated. And the idea would be, for example, that patient comes into an acute unit, uh, they have uh, undergo a period of a process of assessment involving the system and team, um, and that assessment should act as the entry point or the entry assessment to the to the next stage of care. So if they were seen assessed in an acute unit, have a, a clear plan 
then they could be transferred to a community hospital and, and the plan is uh, you know, followed on without having the need for reassessment. Um, and that's something we've worked quite hard on. It can be helped a lot by IT solutions. Unfortunately, uh, our IT isn't that great, but you know, we, we, we try our best um, paper and pen work as well. Uh, but obviously, if you've got systems that allow you to do that using a uh, computer-based approach, then that's even better. The other thing, uh, apart from the sort of vertical integration between acute and community services, was trying to ensure that um, we had integration within the hospital. So what we've termed horizontal integration. And in the first instance, our collaboration was very much with the emergency department, um, ensuring that we had pathways that were locally negotiated and fit for purpose that the ED team could use and, and, and would help them in their management of this population. But it went beyond just simple care pathways. And we, for example, created fellowships where we train emergency physicians in the care of older people. Uh, and they get to experience the whole system, so they would come and learn core geriatric medicine, but also spend time working in community hospitals, community services, um, specialist geriatric services, to, to develop a rounded appreciation of the care of older people. Um, and uh, at a very practical level, joint ward rounds. So we would, for example, have um, geriatricians uh, and emergency physicians going on the ward round together um, uh, and sharing patients and having conversations which you know, promoted knowledge transfer um, between in both directions. So obviously the geriatrician is learning a lot from the ED team about um, uh, trauma management, fracture management, etc. And hopefully the emergency physician is learning a little bit about why we shouldn't keep doing urine dips on older people or how to manage or differentiate delirium from dementia from, from the geriatric team. So what I'm hopefully describing to you is uh, a whole system type approach built upon collaborative leadership rather than uh, single hero heroes trying to change the world on their own um, and the focus on building those relationships over a period of time and it may take months or years sometimes is, is really critical because if all you, know, you won't get everybody brought into it but you know if you haven't got more than two or three people driving change then it's going to be difficult to sustain that. So the pathway, um, I'll just talk through this because this is useful just to get a feel for what we mean by whole system. We start with the older person in crisis, um, not because that's the most important thing in the whole system, but it's a big focus and it's a, uh, a big part of uh, trying to improve care pathways for older people in general. Um, and the idea is to try and ensure that um, from the earliest point possible when older people present with crisis, that there's some sort of clinical conversation about where they could best be managed or their needs could best be met. So we have what's called a single point of access, um, a, uh, a phone line, if you like, where GPs can phone through and uh, discuss patients that might need admission with the duty geriatrician. Um, and the idea behind this is A, to come up with a clinically driven uh, decision about the ongoing management of the patient, and B, to promote, uh, again, knowledge transfer from primary care into secondary care and vice versa. Um, again, I'm not saying Nestor gets this right all the time, but the fact that we've got a phone and people can phone up and have a conversation is, is good uh, and, and we think that's a really important part of starting to develop the relationships in the whole system that will allow better management for older people. So for those patients for whom it was agreed that a home-based period of care or intermediate care, so whether it be home-based or bed-based, such as the community hospitals would be appropriate, the clinical conversation through the single point of access would lead to a clinical management plan, a problem, stratified problem list that would uh, then be uh, delivered using uh, community services either in the patient's own home or in a community hospital where uh, we have a team of advanced nurse practitioners supported by geriatricians to manage uh, older people uh, in, in, in that setting. So again, ensuring that the component, the, t the team members required to deliver CGA are available uh, in the community setting. So as with most community hospitals, we've got great nursing, rehab nursing staff, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech and language, etc. Uh, the AMPs are, are, are fantastic because they come with that holistic nurse background um, and through the support for their own development, but also supported by the geriatricians, have become very, very competent at managing geriatric problems. 
Uh, so again, ensuring that wherever the patient is in the system, we can get to uh, get, give them access to CGA. For those patients for whom admission was thought to be necessary, we tried to ensure that the front door, the, the first 72 hours, if you like, was uh, frail friendly. Um, again, try, we're trying to embed the principles of comprehensive geriatric assessment into care pathways. So that manifested in, in two discrete areas, the emergency department, which I've described briefly to you, uh, which comprised an emergency frailty unit, which was um, uh, access to which is uh, driven by pathways, but frailty pathways rather than condition-specific pathways that identify the, uh, the likely needs of the patient. And that would be a sort of off-the-clock area, clinical decisions unit, observations, ward, call it what you will, where older people who couldn't go straight home from, for, say, the majors area because they needed a further assessment can be assessed uh, with the anticipation that they'd be going home in the next 12 to 24 hours. So a, a you know, hyper-acute short-stay unit for older people with frailty. Staff is described previously with a combination of emergency physicians, geriatricians, um, and uh, multidisciplinary team members uh, who can deliver the, uh, a holistic uh, care package suitable, suited to the needs of this population. And the sorts of patients we see there would be patients with you know, falls, minor trauma, fractured pelvis, uh, pubic bone mass fractures, those sorts of uh, problems. Uh, some delirium, if it wasn't too difficult or too challenging to manage, and there was reasonable prospects of getting people back either to their own homes or to community hospital or back to care homes, for example. So ambulatory care, but for a population who are not typically ambulant in the sense of walking. Um, and that, that's, uh, I'll show you some data on, on the impact of the EFU as we conceptualised it um, in, in the next slide or two, but it certainly did seem to work from a clinical perspective. The, the other part of it, which is, I think, probably uh, almost more important uh, than the uh, observation ward round, uh, observation unit ward round, was the um, involvement of uh, geriatricians into the majors area. So after the ward round in the morning, the geriatricians would provide in reach to the main emergency department, so-called majors, and advise the, the teams there on managing all the people, identifying those that could be diverted to their priority unit. Uh, and um, supporting um, clinical decisions to get people home where appropriate. So a combination of unit-based or bed-based care alongside um, uh, an in reach type service that seems to work well uh, in the ED environment, which obviously is fast-paced, highly pressurized. The focus um, of the assessments in the urgent, uh, EFU and in the AFU, which I'll describe in a minute, is uh, was to ensure that we triage people to the appropriate setting, establish the likely trajectory, i.e. we anticipate that Mrs. Jones is going to be able to mobilise in three days' time once she's had her analgesia for her pubic venous fracture, and um, then people who are going to be managing Mrs. Jones will know that if she's not sticking to that trajectory, there's a problem, and, 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 and seek to identify the reasons why and, 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 and work those through. Um, and, of course, transfer uh, where, where they're clinically suitable out in the acute hospital setting. Um, so routes out included the community hospitals, home-based intermediate care, um, uh, some access to social care respite or assessment beds, um, which we're quite lucky with um, on the whole, um, or admission further into the hospital. Um, so for example, if someone has acute care needs, they could go to what we now have uh, an acute frailty unit, or at the time was then an acute medical unit where there were some liaisons or frail older people's advice and liaison service used to support the care of older people on the AMU um, and then we subsequently formed that into a, a sort of second acute frailty unit. So there's one downstairs in ED uh, which is small, it's about six to eight beds and, and a larger acute frailty unit upstairs which is 27 beds. So um, Wherever patients come into the system, they have the opportunity to be exposed to frail, uh, frailty services or comprehensive geriatric assessment. Of course, one of the challenges is that um, people that are frail and have delirium or dementia that don't end up on the acute frailty unit may not be able to access CGA as it's currently conceptualised, um, and that's something that we're still working on, but are sort of looking at liaison type approaches uh, with all their inherent problems. As the patient then comes in, uh, they can either go to geriatric wards for CGA care, or if they need a bit specialist care, 
uh, cardiology, heart, uh, respiratory, etc. Um, with some liaison against trying uh, to provide ongoing support, but this particular the dental site, which is separate from the main acute uh, site at Leicester Royal, tended to be mainly with phone support, so a less than satisfactory solution for older people with frailty to end up under specialist care, and that's uh, still an ongoing area of concern. And then routes back out, either via rehabilitation settings or back to people's own homes. The impacts, uh, so our uh, first unit in the ED opened in uh, early January 2011, um, and what you can see here is, uh, this is, uh, well, the first dark blue line there is the number of uh, old people aged 85 or older attending the emergency department, um, and if, if you plot, plotted a sort of regression line on that, you'd see a steady increase of about 5% per year. Um, so yes, there's variation, but gradually increasing numbers. Um, but once we introduced the unit, there was a substantial change in, in the discharge rate from ED. So we saw more 85 plus people going home from the emergency department. Um, so uh, in, uh, about 10% absolute increase in discharge rates, which is quite useful. Translated to about three to four patients a day, which doesn't sound like a huge number, but um, if you think about when these patients get stuck in the system, uh, three to four patient day, patients per day, you know, you're talking 20 to 30 patients per week uh, with uh, you know, length of stays of, you know, the median length of stay in Leicester is about eight to nine days. Some of these obviously would be short stay patients, but it's a significant number of bed days. So uh, that was thought to be useful. Um, and what was particularly pleasing, um, and again reflecting the whole system perspective that we've been trying to encourage, was to see reductions in readmission rates, both at uh, most, most impressively at 90 days, um, but also short-term short readmission, so 30-day readmission rates seem to have dropped down, um, and very short-term, so seven-day readmission rates, probably about the same, no big difference there. The reason we're particularly pleased with the 90-day readmission rates going down is that um, we think that is um, consistent with the idea that if you avoid unnecessary hospitalisation and provide early rehabilitation, uh, particularly in people's own homes, that you avoid uh, hospital associated delirium or inpatient complications such as falls or fractures and ultimately uh, potentially reduce the need for long term care, i.e. care home medicine. Now obviously we don't have data to confirm that but uh, the fact that fewer people are coming back to hospital and um, uh, despite sending more people home uh, is generally thought to be a, an encouraging piece of data. So that was good. Um, the next slide is about the uh, idea of liaison versus frailty. So I talked about how in the early stages from 2013, we had liaison uh, working on the acute medical unit. Um, and then in, I think, the July, yeah, July uh, 2013, we converted that into a frailty unit. Uh, and, and what we've got here is just a simple uh, plot of uh, discharge rates. Again, I know discharge isn't the be-all and end-all, but it's something that we can measure. Uh, we uh, use 85 plus as a proxy for frailty. It's not absolutely correct, but the relative changes are still informative. And you can see that when we switch from a liaison service that trying to deliver CGA to older people with frailty in the ANU to a more discrete unit, we've got a, an increase in the discharge rates. Um, and I think that the factors behind that are um, multiple. Um, so some of it's about um, bringing the team together in a discrete, focused area. Some of it's about the pathways that are created as a consequence of having a unit that raises awareness across the hospital and to an extent across the whole system. There's something about teamwork and bringing people closer together. There's the environment itself, which you know you can redesign and make it more frail friendly, more dementia friendly. Um, and and, and so th th those are some of the factors that we think contributed to the unit success. It's not without problems. There's um, you know, staffing issues here, same as every acute unit across the country, I think. Um, we don't get things right all the time. And, uh, you know, uh, but on the whole, it's, it seems to have led to an improvement in the care, the quality of care, but also in, in increasing the number of people enjoying or profiting from ambulatory care. Um, and it doesn't account, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't account for all older people. Um, so this is uh, our sort of monthly attendance rates of 85 plus, and you can see the bulk of them are going through the acute variety, about three to 5,400 per month. 
but still significant numbers on our other acute medical units in Leicester. So we haven't, uh, we're just about to start looking at liaising into these areas to support the acute units, the other acute units and managing other people with frailty. Um, but you know, the AFU in and of itself is not the single best, you know, it's not the total, total solution um, unless you can get really, really good flow through it, which you know, we do okay, but it's not perfect. Our length of stay uh, on the AFU just uh, about 24, 25 hours, uh, uh, which, is, which is not bad. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these because they're not uh, that informative for your good selves. So, um, key messages. Um, what, what I hope we did is draw the system's attention to the care of fair order people, which is core business. This, this is a population that are growing, but already account for something like 50% to two thirds of all hospital bed days. Um, for whom there is a solution, you know, if we implement CGA and we know what, that we're doing it effectively and efficiently, then we can get better outcomes. And our argument, partly supported by the data that I presented to you, is that yeah, that we can start that, assist, that, that process of holistic assessment in the urgent care context, the better. One of the things we've come up with is this idea of separate units. So discrete units are potentially good, as I've shown you but they should never become separatist, and that's a real difficulty if you develop frailty units um, without working on the relationships and the interdependencies both within the hospital and across the whole system. Um, it will not um, operate as efficiently and effectively as it can. So relationship building really, really important, and hopefully I've given some emphasis to the idea of whole system uh, pathways and thinking about how you deliver CJ, not just in the sector, which is of course good and important, but ensuring that there's a community response that's suited to the needs of this population as well. And the final point really is about ensuring that the clinical pathways come first and that we don't, uh, an integration, if you like, follows the clinical groups rather than just simply organizing, uh, reorganizing um, organizations uh, and integrating them uh, because that doesn't necessarily uh, foster the relationship building, the collaboration, the mutual trust and respect that's required for part to be effective. So I rattle through that. I'm sorry it's slightly disjointed. Um, uh, I think I will come to a pause and I hope that Cathy can take over and help us with any queries or questions or additional information that we'd like to have. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Um, we have got a raised hand, um, Rachel Morris Smith. So I'm going to unmute her to um, see if she can ask her a question. You're unmuted, Rachel. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much for a very informative talk. Um, I was just wondering one question. Um, how do you identify your patients? Okay. Um, so the identification is um, there needs to be simple and not complex because um, if you think about the context, for example, in whether it's starting from the single point of um, access conversation with the GPs or in the emergency department, people haven't got a lot of time, so they don't want to be filling out complicated frailty assessment scales. Um, and our growing understanding is that simplicity is good. So we've just been very used on simple criteria, uh, which are imperfect, but there again, the more complex frailty scales are also imperfect in terms of their precision in identifying the population at risk. So we use, it's just age 85 plus, or I think it's 65 or 75 plus with, from care homes uh, with confusion, whether it be delirium or dementia or fragility fractures, um, and keep it as simple as that. The alternative is to use the um, clinical frailty scale, which you may be familiar with. It's, it's in our yeah. frailty net worth um, toolkit, which you should all be able to access online on the website, uh, which is a sort of pictorial scale that allows people to quickly look at a patient and identify whether they're likely to be frail or not. Um, so just really simple rules to govern complex systems, um, acknowledging that that's imperfect, but it's 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 more about imp um, feasibility and implementation than perfect science. Okay, C can I um, can I just ask one more question? Is that okay? Mm, keep going as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted um, how much your how much do the ED do? So do they do all the clerking and then refer on to you, or because they've the patients have been identified? 
as soon as they arrive into hospital, your team come down and clerk them in things? Um, well, we're trying to blur that. So um, we um, we have uh, what we call, I didn't talk about them very much. Okay, so this is, uh, we have a team of primary care coordinators or clinical navigators, or yeah. you might refer to them as trusted assessors. So these are usually community-based nurses that um, uh, have, uh, have a good understanding. In fact, they're employed by the community trust and have a good understanding of community trust pathways and services that are available. Um, they, they spend a lot of time um, infiltrating the ED and supporting the team there in managing older people with frailty and will be influencing the clinical decision making from the ED doctors from, uh, from the very outset. So they might even be present in the assessment bay when patients arrive in the first 10 or 15 minutes. Otherwise, they'll pick them up in the majors areas. So we start to influence how the ED team are thinking from as soon as patients arrive. That's the theory, and, and yeah. to a greater or extent, the practice. The, the geriatric team, if you like, um, we have um, geriatricians in the ED, um, and the PTCs will come and pull them through if they feel that they need a geriatrician, uh, pull them off the ward rounds on the emergency frailty unit. And as I mentioned, in the afternoons, we have geriatricians working with intent in the ED. Um, seeing patients and influencing decision making there. So it tends to be the, the junior doctors in ED that, that, that do the sort of clerking in an assessment, but they'll be influenced by, by the geriatricians uh, and, okay. the, and the rest of the team. Does that answer great. the question? Thank yes, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so if anyone else has a question, um, feel free to put your hand up or type it. Looks like we've got another question. So from Louise Higgins, she says, in a health system with a shortage of geriatricians, how would you suggest we proceed? Yeah. We are using our acute yeah. GP service with good effect. Yeah, Re really good question, very important, thank you. Um, so I've talked a lot about geriatricians, um, and I, really what I'm talking about is CGA, so the, the process of care, comprehensive geriatric assessment, which is this interdisciplinary, holistic, patient-centered, uh, model of care that delivers uh, is delivered through competencies, not badges or names on on, on, on your uh, title or something. So um, some geriatricians uh, are brilliant at CGA; uh, they can't do it on their own. Other geriatricians are very good at CGA, and some acute physicians are really, really good as well. So it's all about the competency, not about the title. Um, on the whole, you'd expect geriatricians to be good at CGA because that's kind of what they're trained to do. Um, but simply just putting someone in who's got a geriatrician on their name badge doesn't necessarily ensure that the right competencies are being delivered. Which also means if you have a competency-based focus that you can encourage other people who are willing and able to develop that competence if they don't possess it already to help contribute to CGA. So what do we mean by competencies? Well, they're, they're kind of described again on our website, but it's common things like being able to manage delirium or identify delirium, differentiate it from dementia, um, to be able to manage frailty syndrome such as continent, uh, immobility, falls in a confident way, uh, and provide solutions to problems rather than simply just saying, oh, it's not an acute heart attack, off you go. Um, and, and I don't think it matters too much who, who that is. It could be a GP with special interest, it could be an acute physician with an interest, it could be advanced nurse practitioners. Um, so there's lots of different ways of delivering that package of care. And if you, you know, haven't got a ready-made troop of geriatricians or enough of them, then you need to think about um, developing the competencies uh, in, in, in other, or drawing on the competencies from other, other disciplines to help. Okay. Okay, we've got a couple of other questions. Um, so Kat Roberts has says, do your trusted assessors follow patients out into the community, or do you have an inpatient community matrons? and outpatient community matrons? Um, that's another good question. And um, we, I really wanted that role to be blurred um, and for the trusted assessors to do a bit of both, really. So follow pa patients through in the hospital, but also potentially out. Um, the numbers and the kind of frank, the reality on the ground has made that difficult to achieve just because of the, the volume of patients. So the primary care coordinators do follow people through um, using a team, if you like. So it won't necessarily be the individual nurse, uh, or yeah, it's usually nurses. Um, 
but it will be the, the primary care coordinator team that will have a caseload of patients and they'll be following them through to the wards uh, if they're admitted. That hasn't been robustly evaluated and the word on the street from the PTTs is it's not always that effective, uh, but it's certainly worth uh, exploring. And when we first started our emergency frailty unit, we also had a bit of outreach from the ED, uh, so the primary, well, whoever was best placed to provide the ongoing case management or short-term short case management at home would follow the patients through. So it might be, you know, if it was a predominantly a mobility problem, it might be the physio, if it was a home hazards issue, it might be the therapist, or it might be the nurse coordinator, or sometimes the geriatricians would follow people through. Just because you've taken the time to get to know them really well, you've done your holistic assessment, you know what the things are you want to look for, and it's sometimes easy, easier to go and do that yourself and then hand over to community teams. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't kind of continue, mainly just because there was so much else to do, uh, but it's, it's a really nice idea, and, and, and certainly the clinical teams enjoyed it and felt it was efficient and effective. But to be honest, the overall impact in terms of readmissions and so on was difficult to demonstrate. Okay, so we've got a question from Jane Roby. She says, did you focus on 85 plus patients just to make the cohort manageable or because you felt that this was the age group that presented with the most need for the frailty assessment? Yeah, so so 85 is, is uh, we use 85 plus as a, a way of measuring uh, relative changes over time. Um, relative changes over time on uh, uh, what? Sorry, keep getting phone calls. We use 85 plus to to measure relative changes over time. Um, it's it, 85 plus doesn't capture all people with frailty. It will include many people who are not frail, and it will miss many people who are frail. But it's a useful approximation, um, uh, and certainly something that can can be helpful when looking at the relative changes over a period of time. Um, the reason we chose 85 plus is that we've done a bit of work uh, looking at the coding, uh, looking at identifying older people with frailty in the urgent care setting, um, and trying to come up with sort of various algorithms and, and, and simple ways of identifying them, and basically realised that the, <laughs> the easiest way, in fact, from a sort of sensitivity and specificity perspective, so from a scientific perspective, is just to use age. It's imperfect, but it captures about two thirds of all people with frailty. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure if it does. Okay, so um, we've got another question from Louise Higgins. She said, if you could state the most important aspects to the success of the unit, aside from the CGA and points you have raised in the presentation, e.g. transport location, access to diagnostics, etc., what would they be? Yeah, yeah. Um, so apart from the clinical intervention, um, access to investigations is key. So the idea Idea that you can get any tests that need to be done quickly, same day if not the same hour, is absolutely critical because you know these people will need diagnostics, and it's not all just about care. Uh, so access to investigations is key. Uh, portering is is really important, and getting people down for investigations or off the wards or out to transport solutions is very key. We don't have dedicated transport. I think it would make a big difference. We often get patients. Uh, stranded on the unit who could have gone home but missed the ambulance or the cut off times or whatever it might be. So transport is very important. Um, and the other sort of generic bit of the unit that uh, we, we, we could be much better on um, is the sort of IT support. So um, you know, the ability to see system one data or you know, spread data, primary care information, um, and communicate back out with them. Our, our IT is a bit clunky. I think those are the sort of non-clinical things, if you like. Oh, and the other very important person is the, um, the admin, the war clerk, uh, because otherwise the team is not going to spend all their day answering the phone, which is useful because you often get lots of helpful information, but it does distract you from doing the immediate. So I think they're the main things, I would say. Okay, um, we've got another couple of questions just to finish up. Um, the first one is, what is the role of hot clinics? What, what is the role of hot? Hot clinics. Tea, coffee, I missed that. Clinics. Oh, say again, Cathy. Sorry, it's what's the role of hot clinics? Hot clinics, okay. Yeah. Um, depends on how you want to use them. Um, 
So we tried hot clinics as a sort of admission prevention or admission diversion type technique. Found it really difficult to, to, to um, implement, um, even using a single point of access and saying, oh yeah, we can see that patient in the clinic you know, the next day or the day after. Um, just really difficult to achieve at a system-wide level. Um, so I'm, I'm not hugely convinced about them in that context. Um, I think the other thing is, uh, so, so what would you use them for? Uh, follow up, you know, rapid follow up, um, and that, that can work. We don't do a lot of rapid follow up, uh, and I guess the reason is, is that these people's needs are usually more urgent than uh, a clinic appointment, um, unless you can absolutely guarantee it's the next day. But more importantly, uh, often they really struggle to get to clinics. Um, you know, the reason these people, that these populations, are difficult to manage is partly because they're often have cognitive impairment or mobility issues and getting people up to a clinic, uh, so especially once they've been into an acute hospital setting, is just another kind of added burden uh, on their already difficult, uh, in their already difficult lives. So I think uh, we try to emphasize home-based solutions, uh, so delivering what needs to be done in the home-based setting, getting all of the diagnostic stuff done in one stop in the acute setting, um, and then providing ongoing care and support uh, in the in the person's old ho uh, uh, own home, so I don't think I uh, have I'm a, a great fan of hot clinics. And in fact, if I had my way or a magic wand, what we would probably do uh, in Leicester, uh, and, and I know some places have done this across the country, is scrap clinics and put all of that resource into you know, either home-based or acute case uh, urgent care. Because why would you wait six weeks to come to a fourth clinic when you can be seen the next day and get things start, started and sorted? Okay, so um, we've got another question from Kat Roberts. She said, we are in the first few weeks of setting up a frailty pathway. Do you have any advice on which parameters we need to look at to meaningfully evaluate the service? Was there anything you wished to look at earlier on? So I think uh, I would strongly advise that you don't start looking at outcomes until you've got your processes right. And so your immediate measurements will be about the process of care and what component parts of that pathway are working and what aren't. So in the first instance, you might look at your frailty identification and use a quality improvement type approach to work out how many older people are being coded as frail or not frail and whether that part of the pathway is working right. So like looking at the feasibility of what you think you're trying to achieve. Uh, you might look at the component parts of CGA and say, are we delivering you know, a uh, multi-dimensional assessment that includes physical, psychological, cognitive, environmental, social, and functional aspects of the patient's care. Um, you might look at um, MDTs, for example. Um, you know, are we uh, having regular MDTs? Are all the patients being discussed? Are all the relevant members of the team uh, present in the meeting? And how long are they taking? It should be less than one minute per patient in the urgent care setting as a rule of thumb. So I, I would strongly encourage uh, teams to look very much at getting the part, the process of care right in the first instance. You can, of course, be monitoring the impact on outcomes, but it will probably take some months to get the processes right and embedded before you can really anticipate an effect on outcomes. Um, but if you have to monitor outcomes, then you know inevitably systems are being judged by admission and discharge rates and readmission rates, and those things are relatively easy to measure. Um, they probably aren't the most important thing from an older person's perspective, such as quality of life, etc. But um, they are measurable. Um, but I think the key point is to focus on getting the process right and measure process-related metrics first before worrying about the impact on outcomes. Okay, and um, the next question is from Jane. <coughs> she says, your single point of access, does a geriatrician hold the bleep or phone 24-7 or just during call weekday hours? Um, my colleague was holding the phone and I'm supposed to be picking it up and they've just been banging at the door. That's why I was getting distracted. So uh, during the day, uh, we have the duty geriatrician. Uh, so because we've, because we've kind of got two acute geriatricians, one that's down in the ED and one's up on the acute floor. Um, so uh, the uh, either one of the, one of those two would hold it during a day, and that's um, eight till six roughly. Our, our day is on duty, and that's at the weekends as well as um, midweek. 
Um, out of hours, um, the uh, single point of access works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, which is brilliant. Um, it's managed by um, uh, a sort of clinical navigator. Well, they're not clinical. Let's see, uh, uh, I think they're band four or band five. They must be band four. Uh, so a navigator who knows about systems has a, a, a underpinning directory of services that they can refer to. Um, and out, any out of hours calls uh, for sort of navigation purposes would go through that single point of access, whatever the time of day or night is. But the clinical advice, unfortunately, unfortunately is only available eight to six. Okay, so the last question. Um, if there are three times as many care home beds as hospital beds, what is the role for elderly care physicians to work in the care home setting, helping to prevent admissions? I, I just missed the beginning part again, Cathy. That's okay. Um, it's if there are three times as many care home beds as hospital beds, what is the role for elderly yeah. care physicians to work in the care home setting, helping to prevent admissions? Yeah. Yeah, um, very topical and very difficult. Um, so I uh, go back to my previous answer, which is it's not about the geriatricians, it's about the delivery of comprehensive geriatric assessment, and any competent individual or team of individuals should be able to do that. Um, and a focus on geriatricians as a solution for this issue ain't going to work. Um, as the questioner has rightly pointed out, there are too many older people for geriatricians alone to be the solution. So what's the role for the geriatrician in the community setting? I think it is um, leadership type stuff, so raising awareness, uh, supporting, encouraging, nurturing, uh, advising, service development, supporting education and training, contributing to government, um, and some direct clinical care, um, but very much with the emphasis on the sort of non-clinical side of things and developing the systems rather than trying to deliver direct clinical care to thousands of older people that are in cans in each of the systems that we're working on. Um, lovely. Some, the last comment is, uh, thank you so much for a great, great webinar and all your guidance. Um, apologies that I need to leave slightly early. But, um, <laughs> yeah, sorry uh, about all the interruptions in my <laughs> um, Well, that, that's all the questions. So um, thank you, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. As there's no more questions, this brings the uh, end to this session. Um, if anybody comes up with any questions they'd like to ask Simon uh, when this webinar is finished, please email us at frailty at nhsselect.org.uk and we will get those questions answered for you. Um, thank you very much for taking the time out to, to provide us with this presentation, Simon. It's really appreciated. And thank you and goodbye. Thank you all. Yeah, no problem.